The Night Beat starts right now. We begin tonight with a developing story out of Kerr County. The sheriff's office there says a car crashed into a group of motorcycles on Highway 16 south of Kerrville, killing three people and critically injuring nine. The group of riders, members of the Thin Blue Line Law Enforcement Motorcycle Club. In a post on Facebook, the sheriff's office says the group was riding through the hill country to celebrate the club's birthday when a driver crossed the center line, causing that crash. The driver was arrested and is facing several charges, including intoxicated manslaughter and intoxication assault. We were not given any other details, but we'll bring the latest information as it becomes available. Meanwhile, 1,108 more cases of COVID-19 and 11 new deaths to report in Bear County tonight. Those numbers bringing the total case count to 28,633 and our death toll to 251. In addition, the city's website shows 1,144 patients in local hospitals with 426 in the ICU and 293 on ventilators. City officials report no hospital capacity improvement with 11% of staffed beds still available at this time. And tonight, the city of San Antonio mourning the loss of two more of its own employees. City manager Eric Walsh announced an Alamo Dome temporary security guard whose name has not yet been released has died from complications caused by COVID-19. The security guard worked seasonally since 2006. The announcement follows the death of San Antonio fire apparatus mechanic Hector Rodriguez, who died last night. Rodriguez served the city for 29 years. The fire department urges residents to honor Rodriguez's memory by wearing a face mask and practicing social distancing. In other news tonight, the family of a 16-year-old boy is grieving after he was shot and killed in their home off Lands Pond on Thursday. It was originally described as an accidental shooting. The Bear County Sheriff's Office says Moses Reyes and a group of teens had been playing with the gun when it went off, killing Reyes. His father tells the night team Stephen Cavazos about his last moments spent with his son. I tried to do whatever I could to help him. I hugged him and I told him I loved him not to leave me. The father of Moses Reyes recalls the last moments he had with his 16 year old son. Reyes's father was not ready to be seen on camera, but tells us he remembers hearing a gunshot go off in the house. After rushing into his son's room, that's when he saw Moses laying on the floor. He had been shot. Reyes says his son died in his arms. Took his last breath. He was gone. He just turned white. It sucks because I'm his dad. I'm supposed to help him. The Bear County Sheriff's Office is still investigating the shooting, but they say Moses and a group of teens have been taking pictures with a gun when a 14 year old girl pulled the trigger. The teen who later confessed was arrested and faces manslaughter charges. Deputies are still searching for two other teens. Reyes says he's not sure how the group got a hold of the gun, but his life has now changed forever. Took my son away from me. I'm never going to see him ever again. Reyes says his son wanted to pursue a professional career in basketball. The teen who stood at 6'2 dreamed of playing overseas. I told him, as long as I'm still alive, you know what I mean? I promise you I'm going to do whatever I can. I don't care what it costs. And even when times were hard for the family, Reyes says Moses thought of others. He'll think about everybody else beside himself. Even if that was his last dollar in his pocket, he'll give it to somebody else. But now all he has are memories and dreams of one day reuniting with his son. I just want to be with my son. I just want to hug him so that we could go play basketball one more time. Now, it's not clear if anyone else will face any charges. Sheriff Javier Salazar says more investigation needs to be done. He does say the group of teens did also have a second gun, which they are searching for. Reporting live outside the Bear County Sheriff's Office, Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. Tim Courtney. Thank you, Stephen. New on the night beat, San Antonio police say a man is in custody tonight following a brief standoff with officers southeast of downtown this afternoon. Officers called to the 600 block of Caton Avenue earlier today for shots fired. When they arrived, neighbors say a man had come out of a home and began firing. When officers visited that home, they say the 35 year old man inside refused to come out, but did open a window in order to speak with police. It took them about 45 minutes to get the man to agree to leave the home. We're thankful that nobody was seriously hurt. Uh, it's, under, it's our understanding that there may be multiple weapons inside of the residence, so we are getting a search warrant so we can go in and, and secure those weapons. Police believe or tell us they believe the man was under the influence of narcotics and that he has a history of drug use. That man facing a charge of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. 
Other top stories tonight. Police say a man is critically hurt after exchanging fire with police. Before the shooting started, San Antonio Police Chief William McManus says an officer was responding to a family violence call at an apartment on Canyon Parkway near Bulverde Road. The officer says he was talking to the woman who made the call while she was on the balcony, saying her boyfriend was inside with a gun and a knife. Moments later, that man started firing. There were expended shotgun shells uh, on the balcony, and there was at least one shotgun round that went through the apartment building on the other side of the, of the, uh, of the driveway. The gunfire stopped briefly when a second officer showed up, but by the time the first officer told the second to take cover, the man started firing again. The officers fired back and hit the man several times. The officers were not hurt. Chief William McManus says the woman who made the call had a two-month-old baby in the apartment with her. Neither of them were hurt in the crossfire, but police say the woman had been beaten. We have learned the identity of a man who was shot and killed late last night. The medical examiner's office says the victim is 28-year-old Justin Johnson. 25-year-old Isaac Sandoval is now facing a first-degree murder charge in connection with Johnson's death. The shooting happened just before midnight on Molina Street. That's where police say they found Johnson in the middle of the street with a gunshot wound to the chest. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Sandoval was arrested a few blocks away in the 100 block of DeFost Avenue. His bond now set at $100,000. Police say a woman was hospitalized in critical condition following a shooting on Canario and Santiago Street that happened just after midnight. The victim was found with a gunshot wound to the wrist and the chest. Police interviewed several people at the scene, but said no one said they knew what happened. Or no arrests have been made. A historic robbery aboard a small San Antonio train 50 years ago reenacted today for a positive purpose. Back in 1970, the Brackenridge Eagle train took passengers on a tour around the, the zoo in Brackenridge Park area and was robbed at gunpoint by two masked men. Now that piece of history is being used in a fun way to improve the zoo during a tough time. The night team's Devin Clark walks us down memory lane with two men who were on the train the day it was robbed. It was my 11th birthday. Uh, we were here with the family. Greg Hargis had an 11th birthday that stands out from all the rest. He was one of 75 passengers aboard the Brackenridge Eagle train when two masked men robbed it at gunpoint on July 18th, 1970. There was a man sitting right behind the engineer that was laughing at him, that thought it was a big joke. And one of the gunmen held a gun to his head and he just laughed at him. Zoo officials say it was the first time in 47 years that a train had been robbed in the Wild West and still to this day, the last known train robbery in the state. But Greg Hargis and his brother Jeff soon learned what was happening was nothing to laugh about. He started grabbing purses and cameras and all that talk went away. And uh, so then it was it just got quiet for a while. $500 worth of stolen goods were confiscated by the suspects who were later caught and served time for the crime. Though the moments were scary, no one was hurt. Today, the event was reenacted as a way to help raise money for the zoo. For $10, passengers were able to hop on board and take a trip down memory lane. All the proceeds go towards funding a new engine for the train. Let's go, let's go! Instead of real robbers holding you at gunpoint, we have actor educators dressed in full costume asking for donations at bubble gum gunpoint. So bubble guns are being used. It's a very fun time. Today the train was packed with passengers who were able to enjoy the sun and get a lesson in history. On top of that, they were able to help raise money that zoo officials say is much needed to maintain operations. They say that the coronavirus pandemic has taken a toll on the zoo. Today's ride may have helped keep the train on tracks for years to come. At the San Antonio Zoo, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Outside with live cam, a much more seasonable July day. Our high temperatures generally limited to the mid to upper 90s, which is about where they should be for this time of year. And even a little bit of rain out there. Now that rain was not as widespread as what we needed it to be, but it was a little something. Nothing fell at the airport, unfortunately, or nothing was measured at the airport. We did see a high temperature of 97 today. Again, that's just two degrees above average for this time of year. So pretty seasonable 101 out in Del Rio. That was one of our only spots that got into the triple digits today. You'll notice Carrizo Springs, U Valley limited to the low to mid 90s because you guys got a little bit of rain. We could see a few more coastal showers tomorrow, but better chance of rain looks to return to the forecast later next week. We'll talk more about that and get you ready for your Sunday coming up. 
Still to come in the night beat, John Lewis, a civil rights icon and representative from Georgia, has died at the age of 80. We'll take a look back at his life and the legacy he leaves behind. Plus, the latest in the case of Breonna Taylor, who was shot and killed by police in her own home. Her mother now suing the Louisville police officers connected with her death. But first, with the new school year just weeks away, staggering new coronavirus numbers. Johns Hopkins University reporting a 40% increase in cases of COVID-19 worldwide in just the past few weeks. The latest next. Well, more than 65,000 new cases of COVID-19 were reported in the U.S. today. Yeah, meanwhile, here in Texas, the worst daily death toll yet. ABC's Megan Tiverzian is in San Diego with the latest. New cases of the coronavirus continuing to spread all over the U.S. 19 states posting their highest number of new confirmed cases in a single day this week. Police cracking down on so-called COVID parties, like these house parties in Central Florida. When I hear about these COVID parties, it just, you know, makes my head spin. You're not in a vacuum. You are part of the propagation of the outbreak. The death toll in Florida now exceeding 5,000 as Governor Ron DeSantis continues to push for in-person classes in the fall. And as a father of three young kids, uh, I do not fear this virus's effect on my kids. I think the risk is, is incredibly low. Texas logging 10,000 new cases for the fifth day in a row. A troubling update from a single Texas county. 85 infants under the age of one have contracted the virus since March. First time mom Angelica Wendell saying her two month old daughter tested positive. So I've never like had a, another baby to experience any type of illness with. So when you find out it's COVID, it's just like heartbreaking. 34 states now reporting increases in hospitalizations. Kentucky's governor, Andy Bashir saying his state is in dangerous times, reporting its second highest single day total. We gotta be careful. We gotta make sure that we are wearing our facial coverings. The debate over wearing masks still sparking pushback. These demonstrators in Ohio holding an anti-mask rally outside the state house. It's my body, it's my choice as to whether I wear a mask or not. I don't see people wearing masks and I see a total disregard for what's going on in the world around them. It's very disheartening. Megan Tavrizian, ABC News, San Diego. Much more comfortable temperatures out there today, and some people got the extra added benefit of a little precipitation. Yeah, yeah. I walked outside after our early show, yeah. and I saw, you know, I smelled the rain, and I was so excited. Little puddles there, too. <laughs> that, puddles. Was, that was nice. Yeah, I mean, and that was a teeny, teeny little baby shower. Uh, there were some thunderstorms out there, some non-severe thunderstorms this afternoon, generally well south of Highway 90. So, yes, a few lucky yards did get a little bit of rain. Always welcome because we certainly need to make up some ground as far, far as rainfall is concerned. So we've got less than two weeks left in the month of July, and so far each day our high temperature in San Antonio has been above average. And if you add them all up and divide by 18, our average high for the month of July so far has been 100.8 degrees. We've had 11 days with a high temperature at or above 100. We actually uh, finally broke the triple digit heat streak. We had eight days in a row with a high of at least 100 today. That came to an end with a high of 97. And as you look at the planning forecast, no triple digits in the forecast. That does not mean we won't see them again this summer. I would bet we do see some more triple digit days here before the summer is up, but it's nice to see some more seasonable temperatures as we get into next week. The reason for this bit of relief, the heat high has moved away. It's centered off to our north, and that is producing a lot of big time heat, more heat advisories for other portions of the country this weekend, but it will stay generally centered off to our north. That keeps us out of the triple digits. That also opens the door for really low coverage rain chances this Heat high kind of hanging around doesn't allow for any big rainmakers to move on through, but as you'll see as we get into next week, 10% chance of a stray shower, but I actually think as we get into next Friday and then the start of next weekend, we'll have a better chance at some isolated showers as a little disturbance is able to move on through. As far as Doppler radar is looking right now, we've just got the radar returns there from the bats leaving their cave. All the shower and storm activity from earlier 
has fizzled on out, but this has allowed uh, some of us to drop into the 70s much sooner than we would have. A uh, little rain cooled air off to the south and to the west. You're already in the upper 70s, Carrizo Springs, 77 now in Uvalde. No rain in Del Rio, so you're still in the mid 80s, as are we here in San Antonio. Nice little breeze out there. I also think that as those showers were kind of falling apart, they put out some outflow boundaries, um, and so that's kept a Pretty decent breeze in place this evening. Now, as we get into the overnight hours, winds will become light, just about five miles per hour. Partly cloudy to mostly clear skies. I do think we'll start off with some low clouds tomorrow morning and temperatures in the mid 70s. 10 a.m. We're in the mid 80s, climbing back into the upper 90s tomorrow afternoon. But again, this is about where we should be for this time of year, uh, not in the triple digits. Another mix of sun and clouds tomorrow, but you'll notice I'm going to keep rain chances out of the forecast for the majority of us tomorrow. If you're down closer to the coastal bend, you have a better chance to see an afternoon coastal shower or non severe storm pop up. But again, it's going to be confined to our counties much closer to the coast. And unfortunately, we won't have a repeat of today as far as rainfall is concerned. But again, it is looking like late next week we'll see a disturbance start to roll in right around Friday and that does take our rain chances up slightly. Hopefully as forecast confidence grows, maybe we bump this number up on Friday. I do think that's the better day next week to get maybe a little bit more rain across the KSAT viewing area. But if you're down closer to the coast, those Afternoon coastal showers will be possible essentially each day, so uh, that's kind of the pattern we find ourselves in for now. Temperature wise, mid to upper 90s heading into next week, and I will take that for the time being. Yep, no 100s. That's fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's not a lot the NBA players can do while they're living in the bubble at the uh, mouse house. Yes. But apparently ping pong is approved. As sport. long as you play singles. Ah. No doubles allowed, and you have to wear masks. Coming up, the Spurs held a bubble ping pong challenge. We got the winner. Plus, Spurs young gun, Keldon Johnson, has a smile. It just lights up the room. Coming up. Spurs rookie small forward Keldon Johnson is ready to resume the season in Orlando with coach pop making it clear this week that his main goal in Orlando will be developing the younger players. Johnson will get some serious playing time. He spent most of his rookie season in the G League with the Austin Spurs and finally worked his way up to the big club just as the season was about to be suspended. He appeared in nine games for the Spurs, but during the final four games of the regular season, Johnson posted seven points and 2.8 rebounds in 16.7 minutes per game. His his best showing was a 13.5 rebound performance against the Brooklyn Nets on March 6th. Young man has a game, of course, and a smile. Well, that won over his teammates. His energy, his smile is the best thing. Uh, he brings a light to the team. Uh, me and Pop was talking about it uh, the other day. And uh, just when he, you know, walks in any room, it doesn't even have to be a gym. You know, he walks in a room, uh, he's smiling and, you know, he's smiling with every single so I think that's the best thing about him. He just brings a lot of energy. He's always happy. He's always just making people smile. Um, I mean, we all know people like that and you always want to be around with people like that. So um, I mean, it's always great to have a player like that on the team. I mean, he's young, he's energetic and um, he's excited to show what he can do at uh, the NBA level. And I mean, defensively, I mean, he's got a good size, good length. I mean, and he competes. So that's what he um, a big thing on defense if you compete and, and he wants to be good defensively, so that's always nice. With injuries to players ahead of him in the rotation like LaMarcus Aldridge and Trey Lyles, Johnson will have a shot to showcase the promise he did roughly four months ago. And since the Spurs were off today, they held a bubble ping pong tournament with players and staff members. It was single elimination and masks were mandatory. 22 entered the tourney, but only one walked away as champion. The final was best of three, and in the end, athletic development coach Kelly Forbes was crowned Spurs bubble ping pong champion. His prize, a can of Lysol. Yep, the Spurs are scheduled to return to practice tomorrow. Looking to protect the players, the first exhibition games of the NBA restart will go a little more quickly than usual. The NBA is tweaking the rules for those initial matchups, going with 10-minute quarters instead of the usual 12 minutes. The changes for several reasons, among them not wanting to overly tax players' bodies after they went more than four months without games, and because some teams don't have their full rosters at Walt Disney World yet because of coronavirus and other issues. Each team will play three exhibitions, and the last two for each club will have the traditional 12-minute quarters. Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm.
The NFL has informed teams their training camps will open on time. League executive Troy Vincent sent a memo to general managers and head coaches today informing them rookies are to report by Tuesday, quarterbacks and injured players by Thursday, and all other players should arrive by July 28th. The league and the NFL Players Association are still discussing testing for coronavirus and other health and safety protocols. Union leadership expressed several concerns in a conference call with reporters Friday. However, under the collective bargaining agreement, the NFL can impose report dates. And EA Sports will alter the upcoming release of Madden NFL 21 to remove logos and the team name of the Washington Redskins. Because the game is so close to its August 25th release date, versions of Madden NFL 21 acquired via disc will still contain the name when first installed. However, an automatic patch will remove the name and logo when the game is connected to the Internet. And coming up later in sports, the Jante Murray talks about the Spurs lineups as they get ready to restart the season in Orlando. And you know Pop likes to tinker with those lineups. <laughs> Tinkering is what he does best. That's right. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> you got it. Still ahead tonight, the country reacts to the death of civil rights icon and Georgia Representative John Lewis. We'll look back at his lasting impact on our nation. Congressman John Lewis being remembered tonight for his work in the struggle against racial discrimination in our country. President Trump ordering flags to be flown at half staff at the White House and all federal buildings, then tweeting his condolences this afternoon, writing he was saddened to see the news of the civil rights heroes passing. Here's ABC News' Rachel Scott with the details. Born the son of Alabama sharecroppers in 1940, John Lewis was the youngest and last survivor of the big six civil rights activists who in 1963 planned the historic march on Washington. Let us not forget that we are involved in a serious social revolution. Lewis suffering a fractured skull on Bloody Sunday in 1965 as 600 peaceful protesters crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. They were met with violence from state troopers. Elected to Congress in 1986, representing Georgia's fifth congressional district. Today, his colleagues remembering him. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi calling Lewis a titan of the civil rights movement whose bravery transformed our nation. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell writing, you did not need to agree with John on many policy details to be awed by his life. Awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the country's highest civilian honor in February 2011. Generations from now, when parents teach their children what is meant by courage, the story of John Lewis will come to mind former presidents honoring the civil rights icon too. Bill Clinton writing, John Lewis became the conscience of the nation. And Jimmy Carter saying, all Americans owe John Lewis a debt of gratitude. President Trump ordering flags at the White House and all federal buildings to be lowered at half staff, as is customary following the death of a sitting member of Congress. Lewis, an outspoken critic of the president, skipping his inauguration and first State of the Union address, often reminding people to choose love over hate. It doesn't matter whether we are black or white, Latino, Asian American or Native American. It doesn't matter whether we are straight or gay. We are one people. We are one family. We all live in the same house. Lewis spoke often about being in good trouble and said he wanted to be remembered as someone who wanted to help out. His final public appearance just last month, most fittingly, at Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, D.C. Rachel Scott, ABC News, Washington. Meanwhile, a petition to rename an iconic Selma, Alabama bridge after Representative John Lewis now has more than 400,000 signatures. As you heard in that story just now, Lewis marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge back in 1965 on what's now known as Bloody Sunday. Law enforcement beat him during the demonstration. The bridge currently named after a Confederate general and a KKK leader. A new lawsuit alleges Brianna Taylor survived several minutes after being shot in her home. Taylor's mother is suing the three Louisville police officers connected to her death. Taylor's boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, called 911 after the shooting and says he was shouting for help. He says the officers on the scene didn't rush in to give assistance. The coroner refutes the claim that Taylor could have survived several minutes after the shooting. She says given Taylor's injuries, medical care could not have saved her life either way. Taylor was shot and killed when police executed a no-knock warrant at her home. Presidents Bill Clinton and George W. Bush have been moved from the grand foyer of the White House. Sometime within the last week, the portraits of the 42nd and 43rd presidents were moved out of their prominent placement. 
White House aides tell CNN they've been placed in the old family dining room, a small, rarely used space not often seen by most visitors. Now in the grand foyer are portraits of William McKinley, the nation's 25th president, and his successor, Theodore Roosevelt. The move goes against White House tradition to feature the more recent office holders. President Trump has at times disparaged Presidents Clinton and Bush. And the official portrait unveiling for former President Barack Obama is not expected to happen during the president's first term. News around the world now an arson investigation launched after a historic church caught fire in western France. Crews responded early this morning to flames and smoke at the 15th century cathedral of St. Peter and St. Paul in the city of Nantes. The fire was contained and did not reach the roof, but the organ and some stained glass windows were destroyed. The city's mayor says the flames broke out in three separate places. This fire comes about one year after the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris was badly damaged by fire. More now in the coronavirus. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration has authorized COVID-19 pool testing, which will allow multiple people to be tested at once. The agency announced an emergency use authorization for Quest Diagnostics today so the company can test up to four people at once. The FDA commissioner said sample pooling is an important step to helps, uh, that helps get COVID-19 tests to more Americans more quickly while preserving testing supplies. This comes as the United States could see more than 157,000 deaths by the end of the first week of August. That's according to a new forecast just released by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The prediction pulls together two dozen individual forecasts made by outside groups and researchers and gives a range of nearly 150,000 deaths and more than 168,000 deaths. The CDC predicts the states will record the most deaths in the coming weeks include Arizona, Florida, Oklahoma, and here in Texas. As of last night, there have been nearly 140,000 deaths from COVID in the U.S. Many of us have had to cancel our summer plans and trips amid the pandemic. If that includes you, you may want to look into a road trip in an RV. We'll help you get started next. Concerns about the coronavirus have pushed a lot of people to switch gears on their summer vacations this year. Instead of airplanes and hotels, they're road tripping in RVs and sales and rentals are in overdrive. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz has a beginner's guide. You know, you can't go to the amusement parks. You can't go to the zoos right now. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to camp. So Karen and Mark Zohofsky are road tripping it this summer in their RV trailer. We absolutely do love going with our grandkids. We're leaving this weekend. That's all they've been talking about. And they'll have company. Some RV dealerships have seen a 170% surge in sales, many first timers. When people are looking to get out of the house, a motorhome allows you to do that while maintaining social distancing. It even allows you to avoid some places that you may feel less comfortable, such as staying at a hotel or going to restaurants. With an RV, you bring it all with you. There are two types of RVs to consider, a motorhome that combines living quarters and a vehicle in one, or a travel trailer. Motorhome can be expensive to buy. A travel trailer is a more affordable option. Now, of course, you're gonna need a tow vehicle. Larger fifth wheel style trailers will require a heavy duty pickup to tow. Smaller trailers like pop-ups can be towed by most SUVs or even a car with a hitch. These are easier on gas and you can get in one starting at about 10 grand. If you wanna try before you buy, rent. This company, RV Share, works sort of like Airbnb. They say business is booming, that bookings are up 1600% since April. RVing has become a summer solution. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Another look outside the live cam, 85 degrees at the airport, mostly clear skies. And hey, if you can get your hands on an RV or a camper, take it out the next few days beyond the city lights. And around dusk, you may, able to, may be able to get your eyes on a comet that everyone has been talking about, Neowise. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I've seen a lot about it on Twitter, but really no pronunciation here. Uh, it will be visible for several more nights. You're encouraged around dusk until July 23rd to look to the northwest sky below the Big Dipper, and you may be able to catch a glimpse of that comet, seeing some really cool photos and videos there. So that's something you can take the RV out past the past the pollution of the city lights and get a view of this comet. Pretty cool. We'll talk more about what your Sunday has in store and some low end rain chances coming up in the full forecast. So I had almost forgotten like what I just forgot what we were doing here. <laughs> He, you know what he was doing, Katie? He was looking up 
the forecast to see zero hundred <laughs> hundred <Spot> degree. <laughs> right. I got yes. you, Tim. I forgot what we were doing. <laughs> Check the, welcome to the show. Check Hi. the apps. Make sure everything matches. Make yeah. sure all the numbers match. He figured out yes. that everything you've said is correct. Always. Good deal. Hundred <laughs> uh, percent. Yeah. We it's got you, late. Tim. Big little wink. Big little wink. Um, yeah. <laughs> Here's today's time lapse. I think it looked a little hazy today, especially if you, as you look toward the horizon. That was the case yesterday as well. We actually have a little bit of lingering Sahara dust, and I'll uh, show you what that is. That outlook is looking like coming up in just a few minutes. I did stop this, though. You see a little raindrop there on our uh, live cam camera. Uh, no measurable rain at the airport, and really most of us missed out, but we did have a few showers in and around San Antonio and Bear County today, but the uh, better rain was down to the south of Highway 90, 97 the high today, pretty close to average for this time of year, and thankfully we are keeping double digits out of the forecast for now. Not n never a bad thing, uh, that's for sure. I'm going to go back one here so I can show you where uh, generally the rain today was located well to our south, again, well to the south of Highway 90 with some uh, better rain from Corpus over to Laredo there, but a hot spot here in our area was near Pearsall. Radar estimates an inch and a half of rain that may be overdoing it, but there was a nice healthy cluster of thunderstorms here in the five o'clock hour right along 35 there again near Pearsall. So if you've got a rainfall total for us, I'd love to see it a bit farther to the south down near Catula. Uh, Carl on Facebook told me he got around three tenths of an inch of rain, and that was probably uh, what you got down there off to the southwest where we had some uh, heavier downpours at times this afternoon. Looking ahead to tomorrow, our rain chances will be confined to our counties closer to the coast. The rest of us will miss out on the rain tomorrow. It'll be a toasty one, 97 here in San Antonio. That's where we were today. Again, pretty seasonable. Uh, probably low to mid 90s down closer to the coast where you could have a shower, drop your temperature a bit mid to upper 90s in the hill country and a few spots, maybe about close to 100 degrees as you get uh, closer to the border there off to the west of 35. So we're going to keep our rain chances confined to the coast tomorrow and again on Monday. By Tuesday through Thursday, we could have a stray shower, a non-severe storm here or there. But I do think it'll be later in the week Friday into Saturday that we have a slightly better chance of rain. Now we would still like to see a higher coverage than this, but it does look like we'll have a better chance at some isolated showers and non severe storms toward the end of next week. We talked last half hour about why the heat high moving away keeps our temperatures out of the triple digits. It also allows for some little disturbances to sneak in and these little upper level disturbances can act as a spark for some showers and storms. Now this upper disturbance that we see moving in toward the end of next week is not going to give us the widespread soaking rain that we need. However, it could be enough to spark some showers and storms similar to what we saw today. But again, that won't be until late next week. Until then, good rain is going to be pretty hard to come by tomorrow. A dry day here in San Antonio 75 in the morning 97 in the afternoon a little bit of a breeze here and there winds out in the southeast 5 to 15 miles per hour and again it looked a little bit hazy today but uh, we've got some lingering Saharan dust that should really continue to thin out as we get into the day tomorrow moving off to the west just a bit so maybe a little bit hazy tomorrow but I think it'll look a bit more clear than it did today and the Saharan dust will continue to thin out into the early part of next week so if you notice kind of a hazy look to things we've still got a little bit of that lingering Saharan dust here in San Antonio we will kind of keep our focus on the end of next week for the next shot at some decent rainfall but if you're one of our coastal counties down to the southeast you've got a shot each day at some sea breeze showers and storms guys how'd she do tim i exactly nailed it just, <laughs> just exactly what i saw we check yeah. each other's work that's yes. we have each other's back Fact checking Fact checking. wasn't reading mean comments or anything at all because every uh, everyone's so nice yeah. larry we're talking soccer <laughs> yes uh, san antonio fc was supposed to resume the season last night but the game got postponed well it's back on san antonio fc is ready to play their first match in some four months plus when it comes to the spurs DeJounte Murray likes how their uh, lineups are looking. Coming up next. The Spurs are less than two weeks away from resuming the NBA season in Orlando, and the guys certainly don't seem to mind bubble life. They've all said they're happy to be together as a team and practicing. With LaMarcus and Trey out for the rest of the season, the Spurs are mixing and matching lineups to find what works and what doesn't work. Starting point guard DeJounte Murray likes what he sees. It's been good. Uh, I mean, you got a talented squad at the end of the day, uh, you know, from the first guy down. And, 
you know, they do a good job of, you know, mixing around or trying to figure out lineups or whatever. But we've just been playing and, you know, competing every single day. Competing against the same guys every day can get old, just like it does during a training camp. So it's understandable they want to face another squad. They'll get that chance Thursday the 23rd against the Milwaukee Bucks in the first of three scrimmages for the Spurs. San Antonio FC's match against RGV FC is back on for this weekend. The match was scheduled last night, but postponed after a covered member of the RGV organization tested positive for the coronavirus. This is SAFC's first match since USL suspended play in March. RGV has already played their first match last Saturday, a 1-0 loss to El Paso. And San Antonio believes the extra week of preparation gives them an advantage. I think it gives us an advantage. We get to see... You know, we got to do a little, a little more scouting on the opponent, um, just see what the lay of the land is. And yeah, everything is working for us. We're flying. We're ready to go. Um, everybody's pumped up. Obviously, have been laying dormant for a while, so um, just ready to go all out. The match at HEB Park will be played without fans due to COVID-19. Tiger Woods is way off the pace at the Memorial Tournament, he, but he did play much better today. Par 5, 15th, Tiger sinks a birdie putt, part of his one under 71. He's tied for 37th at two over, heading into the final round. Your leader is John Rahm, 16th hole. He reads the line just right. The ball nearly lips out, but falls down for a birdie, part of four straight birds for him. He went four under 68 and leads at 12 under. Under par, Rom has a four-shot lead heading into the final round of the Memorial Tournament. Ryan Palmer and Tony Finau are both four shots back. Tiger sits at plus two. The Toronto Blue Jays have been denied approval by the Canadian government to play in Toronto amid the coronavirus pandemic. Canada's government doesn't think it's safe for players to travel back and forth from the United States, one of the countries hit hardest by the virus. The Blue Jays are scheduled to start the season July 24th at Tampa Bay. Their home opener was set for five days later against Washington. The team said it is in the process of finalizing a home location for the season. And this will make Gerber smile and get his attention. Check out how the Cleveland Indians celebrate their first win during the pandemic. No high fives allowed, so they did foot fives, foot tapping. I don't know what it's called. Toe tap. Yeah, the Indians beat the Pirates <laughs> five to three, one of three summer camp games today to give teams a chance to get used to some of the new rules, basically a dress rehearsal. Victoria Generals playing the Flying Chonklas at the Wolf tonight. College baseball, Chonklas down one nothing in the bottom of the second. Grant Smith grounds one pass short. Peyton McDowell rounds third and heads home. The game will be tied at one after two. And how about a large size fountain drink to keep it cool in the heat? Third inning, Tuffy Dornberg has bases loaded, sends this one to short left. It plates Reese Johnson. Generals go up two. They'll add two more to take a 5-1 lead. The Chonklas would tie the game at five in the bottom of the ninth to force extra innings. And the Chonklas walk off with the win in the bottom of the 11th, 7-6. to six. That Woo. deserves a foot five. Yeah, so they're probably doing this. Right I now. like foot I knew six it. feet. There you go. Oh. <laughs> Any day the tribe makes it into the sports, that's a good thing. Thanks, Just Larry. for you. You guys are the cutest. <laughs> we'll be right back. I already had my something good. Larry talked about the Indians, but. Here's a little something. Good okay, yeah, this is a good one. <laughs> a little dog named Astro appears to be okay after leading first responders on a wild chase down a Washington, D.C. expressway. Look at him go. <laughs> it's hard not to watch this and read at the same time. Oh, his, no. his owner was involved in a crash. First uh -oh. responders put him in a firefighter vehicle, but that's when Astro's owner went to get him. He escaped. The high-energy pup was too fast for rescuers to chase as he sprinted down the beltway. Some drivers stuck in traffic even got out and tried to help, but they failed too. Astro eventually veered into the woods and finally slowed down enough that authorities could rescue him. This is a fast little guy. Well, we're glad they got him. Yeah. Hopefully the person in the crash is okay. <laughs> yeah. That's all of our time for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to catch GMSA tomorrow morning starting at 6. Have a great night.